I just want to go to sleep and not wake up. Confessions from Miss K you won't hear on Duck Dynasty. He did do some physical abuse. And why she stood by her man. I'm convinced that if I hadn't stayed with him, he would be dead. Plus, a shocking report about the state of marriage in our country. That is a big deal to know. Get the real truth behind divorce rates on today's 700 Club. It's like you can see hope coming back into their eyes. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. Let's go over to the CBN News Desk for today's top headlines. Gordon, a deadly storm system has killed more than 40 people in seven states, and it's not over. The massive front stretches from New Mexico to Michigan and is moving eastward. And as Heather Sells reports, Texas has been especially hard hit. That's it! Oh, my God, that's it! That's it! Just outside of Dallas, a tornado roared through the neighborhood of Rowlett. It tossed trucks and tore trees apart. Another twister hit the suburb of Garland. It was clocked as an EF4. I looked out my window and saw the, the funnel, and I just dove into the hallway. It was spinning just right towards us, and all you heard was just debris hitting the house, hitting the house, hitting the house. Survivors were thankful that their lives were spared. I'm just very grateful there were alive and that we're all saved. All this can be replaced. The tornadoes have killed at least eight people in the Dallas area and injured dozens. And it's not just tornadoes. The same weather system has brought heavy snow and flooding to other areas. In northwest Texas, drifting snow has shut down Interstate 40 into New Mexico, and authorities are discouraging travel in 26 counties in the Texas Panhandle. In Oklahoma, the governor has declared a state of emergency because of blizzard conditions. There's also an ice storm warning out west with two to four inches of sleet and snow expected by late Monday. Eastern Oklahoma is under a flood warning and flooding in Missouri has already killed several and led to a state of emergency there as well. The severe weather has affected busy holiday air travel. Airlines have canceled more than a thousand flights and delayed more than 4,000. The winter storm will continue to disrupt travel for days. It is expected to advance to Chicago today and hit the Northeast tomorrow. Heather Sell, CBN News. And CBN's Operation Blessing is on the scene responding to the catastrophic events in Texas. Advanced teams are arriving throughout the day and they'll coordinate with local churches and emergency management teams. We'll be updating their progress at CBNNews.com. Turning overseas now, Iraqi forces have taken a key government complex away from ISIS in the city of Ramadi. The Iraqi military drove Islamic State fighters from the buildings in the heart of the city. Some Iraqi military leaders are saying the battle for Ramadi is over. But the head of military operations in Anbar province says ISIS still controls parts of the city. The Iraqi military, with the help from U.S. military advisors, launched the offensive last week after months of U.S. airstrikes. ISIS captured Ramadi about 80 miles west of Baghdad in May of last year. A message claiming to be from the leader of ISIS issued a call to arms to the world's one and a half billion Muslims this weekend. The voice claims to be Abu, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi rallying support for the Islamic State. The terror group has faced setbacks this year. Troops have been forced to retreat from strongholds in Iraq and his second in command was killed. Baghdadi said waging battle is a duty upon every Muslim and no one is excused. He also threatened to attack Israel and he pledged to, quote, liberate Palestine. With all the hatred in the Middle East, we found a hopeful story of Israeli Arabs training, to, training with Israelis to save lives. Chris Mitchell brings us a story now from Israel. This is a unique volunteer search and rescue team from the town of Abu Ghosh. Israeli Imad Jabir is a Muslim Arab who leads the group. We rescue people. It doesn't matter gender, race or religion. Our goal is to save human lives. It doesn't matter if it's a Jew or an Arab, American, Russian. At the Home Front Command drill site, the search and rescue team practices saving lives from beneath a collapsed building. But in the current environment, with Palestinians carrying out deadly attacks against Israeli Jews, rescuing people may not be their biggest challenge. It's not simple and it's not easy. 
especially in these very difficult times. On one hand, we are Arabs, Muslims, and we residents of the state, citizens of the state of Israel, that raise up a unit like this. There are some 60 men in the unit, with another 42 waiting to join. It's an effort most Israeli Arabs wouldn't even attempt. To raise up a unit like this takes courage. It needs people that are human. We are not fighting against anyone. We don't kill anyone. But the opposite, we are saving human lives. Even as civilian volunteers, they're proud to wear these Israeli army uniforms. We are wearing the uniforms of the IDF. That's an honor for us. Abu Ghosh is about six miles from Jerusalem. It's known for fantastic restaurants that have a large Israeli Jewish clientele and a one-time world record for a nearly 9,000-pound plate of hummus. It's near biblical Kiryat Yerim, where the Ark of the Covenant rested. In modern times, it's known as the only Israeli Arab town along the Jerusalem Tel Aviv corridor that supported Israel in its war of independence. <laughs> This company of Israeli civilians from the Arab sector decided to be good citizens of the state, to be partners in all that happens here, to take responsibility for themselves in time of emergency. Lieutenant Colonel Yigal Dahan is a Jewish home front commander who oversees this group. He's very proud of their hard work and service. I think they've taken a courageous step. Today, in principle, we talk about something scary, and here we find a shared cause that is saving lives, and together it doesn't matter which race, which religion, which gender. I think it's a very important message in general for everything that's happening in this country. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. And back here at home, if you've been traveling during this holiday season, you almost certainly noticed something that made your pocketbook happy, much lower gas prices. Gas prices were at their lowest for Christmas since 2008, and the national average price for a gallon of gas fell below $2 a gallon for the first time since late March in 2009. Analysts expect that gas prices will remain relatively low for the months ahead as well, with gas staying in the $2 range and that could put some extra money in consumers' pockets. And now let's go back over to Terry for a look at how you can help CBN with its ministry and its mission as 2015 comes to a close. Terry? There are only a couple more days left in 2015 and even fewer days left to make a charitable donation that you can deduct from your taxes this year. We'd like to encourage you to give to CBN. Your gift helps bring food, clothing, and medical aid to people all around the world. And it's also used to spread the gospel. Because your donation is tax deductible, you'll be saving money on your tax bill. In short, you'll be a blessing and you'll be blessed as well. So call now, 1-800-759-0700. That's 1-800-759-0700. You can also log on to CBN.com or email plangiving at CBN.org. We'll be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Well, you've heard it said over and over, half of all marriages end in divorce. And things are just as bad in the church as the rest of the country. Well, there's just one problem with that so-called fact. It isn't true. And that can have a dramatic impact on keeping marriages together. Paul Strand brings us the story. Harvard-trained researcher Shanti Feldhahn decided to tackle long-held beliefs about divorce to hopefully right some wrongs. She says just the idea that it's as bad in the church as the rest of the world can demoralize Christians. For a pastor, it means all my work doesn't mean very much. You know, for the average person in a congregation, there's this subtle feeling like, if that's true, if on something as important as marriage, doing what the Bible says doesn't change anything, what does that mean about the Bible? Virginia pastor Daniel Floyd sees how this can hurt the faith. Because the 50% divorce rate inside the church really just said the church makes no difference in your marriage. Um, and that's quite an indictment on the church. Christian psychotherapist Angel Davis says the belief half of all marriages fail can even give people permission to give up. When you have like a statistic like 50 percent, it gives you the option. It's like becomes an option in your mind. 
Feldhahn spent eight years investigating the real numbers, and in her book, The Good News About Marriage, lays out what she found. First, the divorce rate is way below 50 percent and much lower for those who attend church. Feldhahn estimates the overall divorce rate for the country is around 31 percent. And she says the studies of people who regularly go to church all show a much lower divorce rate for them. Maybe 15 percent, maybe 20 percent for all marriages, first marriages, all, second marriages, third marriages. Pastors need to know this. People need to be able to look around the average congregation and say, you know what, most of these people will have strong and happy marriages for a lifetime. Doing what God says matters. That is a big deal to know. Feldhahn cites one example where a pastor tracked 143 couples who he had married. It was 25, 27 years later, less than 10% had been divorced. Therapist Davis says this could go a long way to erasing the doubt that Christianity makes no difference. That there's no power in it to transform. And that is just not true. So those statistics, I think, could help a lot with that belief. Pastor Floyd believes it'll be a major plus for the faith when this new knowledge gets around. But if you have regular church attendance, then it's going to make a difference in the longevity of your marriage. I think that is incredible firepower, so to speak, for the local church, for the pastor. Feldhahn says she's seen the power of this new information when she shares it to immediately pump up a congregation's faith. You hear this gasp go through the congregation because it's, and everybody starts applauding, and it's like, you can see hope coming back into their eyes. Shanti's husband, Jeff, says such hope can be crucial in helping a couple actually survive. I mean, Shanti and I have had tough patches, but we never once thought that we weren't going to make it. We knew we were going to. So you work through the tough patches, and you move on to the other side, and the other side is always good. Feldhahn says people can make other choices to divorce-proof their marriage. An example? People who decide not to live together before they get married, um, that has been proven to have a really good effect on the marriage. And so you might get down into the 5-10% divorce odds. Now Feldhahn and others hope people will spread the word. To be able to get this information into other people's hands quickly, I really think we can change the paradigm from discouragement to hope. Paul Strand, CBN News, reporting from Atlanta. Well, that's some good news for, for a change, and I hope it gives you hope for your marriage. I don't know of any marriage that hasn't gone through difficulty. It's tough, and it's tough raising children in today's world, uh, and it's tough raising grandchildren. Uh, but what hope that if you stick with it, there's, there's joy on the other side. Well, we've got a story for you to, that will encourage you on this, and it's from the matriarch of the Duck Dynasty clan. She's going to share what saved her marriage after years of abuse. Alan said, Mom, Mom, don't cry anymore. He said, God's going to take care of us. It was like a light. He turned on the light. Here, why Kay fought for her marriage when we come back. If you're one of the millions who watches Duck Dynasty, you probably already know that the family wasn't always happy, happy, happy. But there is another side to their story you don't hear about on the show. Reporter Michelle Wilson traveled to the Robertson home in West Monroe, Louisiana for a visit with Miss Kay. Every week, millions tune in to watch A&E's hit reality series, Duck Dynasty. While the men and their beards get most of the attention, Miss Kay, the matriarch of the family, helps keep everyone grounded. I had a chance to sit down and talk with Miss Kay, who told me about growing up in Ida, Louisiana, her marriage to Phil, and her role in the early days of the Duck Commander dynasty. I know one thing, I'd be rolling pie dough and answer Duck Commander, and I'd have a little pad with a pencil writing things down. My kids would come in from school and sit on the floor in front of the TV and line up duck call boxes and put the duck call, the stickers on the duck call and then put them in the boxes. Something smell good? Ooh, that would make a hound dog hug a kitty cat on a frosty morning. You are on one of the highest rated reality TV series. Your popularity is growing. Why do you think that's happening? God is blessing us, maybe because he knows we're gonna still talk about him. 
Tell me about your life growing up. You started from some humble beginnings. I did. I was a little bitty town of about 300 people out of Louisiana. Nobody's ever heard of it because when you go through, there's one red light. We're so proud of that light. My grandmother's house was just a place of comfort. I mean, I remember going in there, the kitchen always had pots cooking with the lids where I was bump, 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 bubbling, you know? But she also said something very profound that you would carry with you for the rest of your life. She said, one woman and one man for one life. And she said, divorce is not an option. Phil and Kay met in high school. Phil was a quarterback, played baseball, and loved hunting. Kay was a cheerleader. It was for me love at first sight. I don't know if Phil would say that or not, but I did see him and I thought, mm hmm I like the way that looks. He worked in the oil field. He was a roughneck and his daddy was the driller. Kay and Phil married. After Alan was born, Phil wasn't quite ready for the responsibility of being a father. Phil became a teacher. He also began drinking and running wild, and he had a violent temper. I don't want anybody to stay through an abusive thing, and I had some abuse there, and so that was one thing. Can you talk about the abuse? It was only when he was drunk. The words were the worst. But I'm not saying that he ever didn't do anything physical because there was a time when he drank some real moonshine and he did do some physical abuse that time when he was drank that. Why didn't you just leave at this point? You had gone through so much. I guess I was a loyal person. When I made the vow to God for better, for worse, till death do you part, I'm convinced that if I hadn't stayed with him, he would be dead. The couple eventually had two more sons. Phil left teaching and started managing a bar. He continued drinking and seeing other women. Then one night, Phil came home drunk and accused Kay of cheating on him. For Kay, the abuse became unbearable. I completely lost hope. And uh, that night, as I was crying in that bathroom in that trailer, I really thought about, I just want to go to sleep and not wake up. And I actually looked at the medicine cabinet and thinking if I had something I could just take to go to sleep and not wake up. And then the next thing that happens is I heard those little slippers coming and I could hear them sliding on the floor. And it was Alan and it was Jason and then Willie Jess. Alan said, Mom, Mom, don't cry anymore. He said, God's going to take care of us. And it was like, all of a sudden, I thought, those three little souls, and that's what they were, what would happen? If something happened to me, what would happen to them? I would leave them with a drunk, you know? I mean, it was like a light. You turned on the light. I just said, God, help me. Just help me. The next day, Kay went to a pastor. He said to me, of all things was, Kay, do you think if you died right now that you'd go to heaven? And I said, by all means, I would fly there. I said, because I've lived with this drunk husband and then it's 10 years and my grandmother told me to fight for my marriage. I should have earned my way to heaven. That's what I told him. And then he said, well, do you have peace? Do you have this? Do you have that? And I was like, now that's the problem. I don't have any of that stuff. When he told me the gospel, shared the gospel with me, then I realized I can't earn my way to heaven. Only Jesus did that. He earned it for me. I have to go through him. But you know what? When I did put my faith in him and I did confess him as my Lord and Savior, and then I was baptized, I knew then that I had help, that he was living in me. Kay shared her new faith with Phil. He called her a holy roller and kicked her and their three sons out of their home. Kay moved into an apartment, but instead of being angry, she believed God for the best. What I did, this is more important than any lesson you'll ever learn. I told my kids, your dad has a good heart, but the devil is controlling him right now. The devil is living inside. One day I told my boys, I said, the devil be gone. I said, but for now, don't hate your dad. You hate the devil. My kids and I prayed for their dad. 
to find Jesus. Three months later, Kay was at work when she saw Phil in the parking lot sitting inside his truck. Just big tears were rolling down his eyes, and he said, I can't eat, I can't sleep, I, I, I've got to have my family back. I won't drink anymore. I'm through. And I said, Phil, you said that before. You said that several times before. I said, you can't do it by yourself. You need somebody. And he said, are you talking about God? And I said, yes. And he said, I don't know how to find him. Kay introduced Phil to her pastor, and the two men talked for several hours. The next day, Phil, then 28, went to church where he gave his life to God and was baptized. Kay and the boys were there when it happened. And you know what? Those little boys were so happy. And I looked and those tears and I was crying. It was the beginning of the new life, the new Phil. Shortly afterward, Phil and Kay had their fourth son. Phil began going to church, teaching Bible studies, and even Sunday school. He told everyone he met about the Savior who gave him a second chance. Decades later, his son Jace talked about how God used Phil to lead hundreds to Christ. Then he talked about his mom and just how special she is to their family. He said, now I want to tell you something. You wouldn't have had any of that, nothing, if it hadn't been for my mom. Nothing. You wouldn't know about Jesus right now. But it was my mom's courage to stay with a hard marriage and that commit, stand by that commitment. So she's my first most courageous person. <laughs> Isn't that good? Now see, I made it this the whole time and didn't cry, but you know, it was, it was so true. I know it was, but God pulled me through. And a grandmother. In 2013, on the day of Kay's and Phil's 48 year anniversary, their sons and daughters-in-laws threw them a surprise wedding vow renewal. From the time I was 14 years old, I loved you. I loved you when we were poor and you were not so nice. Now you're really nice and kind. And all I can say about that is, I'm not going anywhere. That's good to know. I will love you forever. You are my best friend and I love you dearly, and I'm gonna be with you for the long haul until they put me in the ground. Good? Perfect. He is my hero. It's, he always refers to me as his best buddy, but it's like we're just together. Now, what is the one thing that you uh, want people to know about you? You know, it's so funny because when we were asked to speak one time, the preacher told me, said, you know what I think about when I see you? And I said, what? And he said, you stand by your man. And he said, through everything, you stood by your man. You told God you would, and you did. So maybe that's it. You did. And now look at the fruit of it. I know. Your the children, their wives, your grandchildren. What a legacy. Well, I had told God and I told my family, if we ever forget where we came from, I pray we lose it all. We just go right back to where we belong if we're going to lose it. Because you don't want to sit here and think this is our life from now on. It may or may not be how long, I don't know. But I want to be able to go right back and not miss a beat. I want that for my kids. My family has many times enjoyed turning on the TV set and watching the Duck Dynasty gang, the family, the whole crew. And I think about, as I listen to Miss Kay talk, the fact that all of that could have been lost. It really could have been lost. You know, God's got a good plan. He's got a good plan for every one of us. Marriage is hard. It's very hard. Two very different people coming together, going through difficulties in life. But boy, when you work it through, when you walk it through together, when you move through those struggles, growing and being refined by each other, look at the blessing. 
doesn't mean it wasn't tough along the way. You know, both Kay and Phil made the same mistake most of us do. Even, even when we've been raised up in church and we've got just enough knowledge to think we're okay, you know, they tried to do it on their own. We were not created to do it on our own. Jesus said that he's the vine, we are the branches. And he said, apart from me, you can do nothing, nothing. And yet we live with this idea that somehow we can pull it off, we can, we can do it on our own, we can make ourselves happy, we can be satisfied. So often we lose everything that's good along the way and by the time we learn the lesson, it's gone. If you're struggling with your marriage today, I want to encourage you to do what they did, to come to Christ and to say, I not only can't do this on my own, I don't want to do this on my own. You see, marriage is a God idea. One man, one woman in a garden with God. That was it from the beginning, and you can have that in your life. It may seem impossible today. There may be struggles that confront you. It's never too late. It's never too bad. It's never over. Trust God in the place that you're at, but be the first one to change. Let God change you first, and then he'll use you in your relationship with your husband, with your wife, with your kids, whatever your scenario might be. Don't do it on your own. Humble yourself before the living God. You can pray right now and do that. You see, first you gotta take care of you before you take care of your marriage. So right now, just pray with me and say, Jesus, you did pay it all for me. I don't have to walk through this on my own. You've already paid the price. My job is to connect with you, to let you come into me, to be hungry for more of you, to walk with you day by day, to surrender everything I am and all that I have. So today, that's what I'm doing. Coming to you, Jesus, saying, yes, I want it all. I want everything you have to give me. And in return, I'm giving you all. And then I'm asking you, God, to heal my marriage, to use me in, in the midst of this. Change me, teach me, touch me, heal my home, heal my kids. God, show us how to live for you. In Jesus' name. Now that prayer is the beginning, so what do you do now? What do you do now? We've got a wonderful little packet we'd like to send to you. It's free. It's called A New Day, and in this packet is information on how do you, not you, not your spouse, not your kids, how do you walk out a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? We want to send this to you. It's free. If you are struggling in your marriage, we've got a great little pamphlet called Love and Marriage, and we'll send both of those out to you. Even the phone call's free. It's 1-800-759-0700. Start with God today and find the amazing adventure and journey he'll take you on. You won't regret a second of it. Call now. Gordon? Well, still ahead, a top cop who wasn't one at all. We began to set guys up. We would pull them over and we would handcuff them and we would take their drugs or their money. Watch what happens when the real police show up later on our show. And welcome back to the 700 Club. Vonette Bright, the co-founder of Campus Crusade for Christ, also known as Crew, has died. Bright died Wednesday due to complications from acute leukemia. She was 89. Bright and her husband, the late William Bright, launched Campus Crusade for Christ in 1951. She also founded the National Prayer Committee to motivate Christians to unite in prayer for spiritual awakening in America. A celebration of life service will be held at First Presbyterian Church in Orlando, January 8th. CBN's Orphan's Promise is reaching children in need in Peru. Orphan's Promise recently hosted a Christmas outreach for 1,000 children in Iquitos. The children received food, presents, and a special Christmas Superbook production. The event was held at an Orphan's Promise-supported children's village and training center where at-risk children come daily for music classes, sports, and crafts, as well as Bible study. You can find out more about what CBN is doing around the world by logging on to cbn.com international. Gordon and Terry will be right back with more of the 700 Club. It's coming up right after this.
As a young single mom trying to finish school, Flissy often had a hard time putting food on the table until she got help from a food pantry supported by CBN's Operation Blessing. When Flissy Allen was just 19 years old, she got pregnant and became a mom. She loved her daughter Lainey, but with no one to help her, she fell into a deep depression. I think I just lost it. I, I wasn't sure where to go. I, I was very isolated. I felt very alone. That all changed when her uncle talked to her about God. She prayed and gave her life to Christ. Jesus really started talking to me. I didn't even know God was real. And now all of a sudden I opened this Bible and the questions that I had for my whole life were being answered. She moved to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, where she attended the Healing Place School of Ministry. But she had a difficult time working, paying the bills, buying food and going to school. It's a struggle with one income, you know, and to provide for a little girl. But sometimes you can't even afford a loaf of bread. Flissy found help through the church. Operation Blessing partners with Healing Place. Pastor Terry Franks leads the Outreach Center. It's all about reaching the one for God. If one matters to God, then that one matters to us. And so we believe that Operation Blessing and our partnerships, it can go so far because what it does is it opens that door to where you can share the gospel with them. When your cabinets get bare, sometimes you don't know where your next meal is going to come from. And then you walk in and here's this bag full of groceries. It's like the biggest relief you can imagine. Flissy graduated from the ministry program. Today she works full time for a nonprofit that ministers to single moms. I have so much joy and I just can't wait to wake up and see how God's going to use me and change people's lives. With the help of Operation Blessing, Flissy and her daughter kept from going hungry grew closer to God and are now able to give back by helping others. Thank you so much for putting food on my table, for feeding my daughter when I couldn't. You know, I mean, it makes a huge difference. It's a relief to me as a mom, as a single mom, just to be able to get through that month until my next paycheck. If you're a CBN partner, you had everything to do with that. That's just one of the outreaches that we support, not just here at home, but around the world. And so we want to say thank you. If you're not a CBN partner, this is a great day to be able to join with thousands of us who are out to touch the lives of people who find themselves sometimes in desperate situations. We really can make a difference, especially when we partner together. So will you join the 700 Club today? It's 65 cents a day, $20 a month, and you'll be able to reach out and touch people like Flissy. Give them hope, a hand up, not a hand out, but a hand up, to find real life for themselves and for their family. So call now. Our number's toll free. It's 1-800-759-0700. And by the way, when you call, will you use something we call Pledge Express? It's electronic monthly giving. It means your bank does all the work. You don't have to have envelopes on hand or stamps or remember to send anything. The bank does it all for you. You can stop anytime you like, but it does save us some administrative costs so that we can put even more of your gift directly into the lives of people like Flissy. And our way of saying thank you for using Pledge Express is to send you Power for Life teachings. These are teachings we receive here at CBN as a team, and we want to be sure that you are have an opportunity to enjoy these as well. So we'll send one to you every month. So call right now. There's the number, one 800 700. Just say, I want to join the 700 Club, and I want to do it using Pledge Express. Thank you. Gordon? Well, coming up, he played the role of both cop and robber all at the same time. Everything that you see on cops, we, that's, that's how we kind of portrayed it to be. And we would take their money and, and leave them out on the, on the side of the road. Watch what happens when this fake cop gets thrown into a very real prison. Up next. A good cop or bad cop? Steve Hershauer wasn't either one. But that didn't stop him from donning a badge and flashing his lights. Steve had no interest in upholding the law. He just wanted to break it. We come up with the, the idea to get a, get a badge, blue and red lights. Uh, we went and bought a Crown Vic. We went and got handcuffs. We went and got gun holsters. When Steve Hershauer wasn't running from police, he was impersonating them. We began to set guys up. We would pull them over, and we would handcuff them, and we would take their drugs or their money. I didn't have no regard for the law. I didn't have any, I just didn't have any type of morals at the time. 
Steve's parents divorced when he was a small boy. After that, he lived with his mother, who was a Christian, but her influence was not enough to make him change his ways. What I knew of God and what I knew, uh, what I knew of Jesus was because of my mom. My sisters and them would sit down and have, you know, they watched 700 Club all the time, uh, Pat Robinson. So we knew, we knew about God and we knew about Christ. I didn't have a, a reverence for him. I didn't have an awe for him. I didn't want to, I mean, I didn't want to follow him. Steve began drinking and smoking pot at a very young age. We'd smoke in the morning before we went to school. It just escalated. I began to drink. I was numb through. I didn't, I didn't care about anybody. I didn't care about myself. Uh, I used anybody that I could to, to, to where I could get high. It was all about me. Steve sometimes stayed with his father, who was a corrections officer in Kentucky. While there, Steve would often visit the jails and prisons with his dad. But seeing the men behind bars did little to deter him. We could see the prisoners, we could see how they lived, we could see the, the, the cells and things like that. And, and it, never, it, it never crossed my mind that I would ever end up there. Steve quit school in ninth grade. The only job he could get was washing dishes, but he always found ways to make enough money to buy drugs. I worked at a restaurant, I worked with some guys and they was doing, they was doing coke and crack. And I mean, that's when, that's when my drug use really got bad. He met Lisa and they had two children. Steve sold drugs to help support them, but also to support his own habit. I would lose weeks. I would lose weeks. I would wake up and think that, hey, it's only been two or three days. And now they're like, no, you've been gone for, you've been gone for a week and a half. You know, once it took over my life, I, I couldn't hold down a job anymore. They eventually split up and he continued his criminal lifestyle. He began impersonating policemen in order to shake down drug dealers. Everything that you see on cops, we, that's, that's how we kind of portrayed it to be. And we would take their money and, and leave them out on the, on, the side of the, on the side of the road. Steve later met Paula, who had been raised in church. She knew Steve was dealing drugs, but she saw something in him that others didn't. I remember when we first kind of spent some time together, we had, I had actually taken him, I was gonna drop him off at home and we ended up talking for like two or three hours that night. I remember looking at him and saying, you must have sisters. And he said, yes, I have three sisters. And I said, well, I can tell. I said, because the way you talk to me, you're just very respectful in how you speak and how you act. Steve and Paula continued dating. Steve tried to quit using drugs, but his past caught up with him and soon he was facing a 20 year sentence on multiple charges. While awaiting his sentencing, he proposed to Paula. To his surprise, she said yes. When I really knew he was gonna be going away, that this was it, this is what he was facing, I just wanted him to know that someone was gonna be there for him. And my parents had been married for years and I took marriage very seriously and I knew at that point in my mind that if I committed to him, I was gonna be committed to him. Steve was given a 15 year sentence. While in prison, he began attending daily chapel services to get out of his cell. Hearing God's words started having an effect on Steve, as did a couple of older women who visited the prison every week. These two ladies used to come, and um, they're called Miss Middleton and Miss Anderson was their names, and I really seen Christ in them. I seen, I, I seen their glow. I, I seen their sh the, just that that shine, that that glow that that you see other Christians have. I wanted to be more like that. If that's what a Christian was supposed to be, I wanted to be more like them. Slowly, Steve's heart began to soften. It showed me something different, and I knew the seeds that they was planting. I would begin to, to think on those things and uh, ponder, you know, get into the Bible and, and go to the scriptures they gave us. I think these two women were placed in my life at that time by God for me. One night, Steve was reading his Bible in his cell. God opened my eyes and he showed me my sin against him. He showed me who he was and how much I needed him. And that broke me. I fell on my knees and, and I, asked him to, I asked him to come to my life and change me. For over a decade, Steve shared his new faith in prison while Paula faithfully visited him. As he grew in his faith, so did she. He was released after serving 11 years and is now a free man. They're expecting their first child, and Steve continues to share Christ with inmates. Through Christ and through his love and through his guidance, you know, you have hope for a future. He's, my, he's everything to me. There's, there's not a day that I could go by without him. I mean, he's, he's my redeemer. 
He has saved me from a life of sin. He has saved me from hell. He has saved me from myself. He's my hero. And he can save you from yourself, too. Maybe you're like Steve, and maybe you've cho chosen a life, uh, and, you're, and you're saying, how do I get out of this? And maybe like Steve, it started when you were young. For him, it was high school. And, and when was it for you? And you didn't understand. At the time you started, you didn't understand that this would become your life. So often we, we think that we can get away with things, but the Bible is true. The wages of sin are death. And if you're involved in any way with drugs, first you start taking them, and then they take you. And they take you down a road that you never thought you'd go. And you, you lose everything. You lose your family, you lose your friends, and at the end, you lose yourself. Here's a question for you, and it's a question that Jesus posed long ago. What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Realize that what God has set in place, the rules he asks us to live by, aren't there to keep us from good things. They're there to keep us from very, some very bad things things that lead to death, things that lead to destruction. And the world wants you to think that somehow or other these things are glamorous, that this is the good life, this is the high life, all that kind of thing. But it really just leads to destruction. There's nothing there. There's nothing there. There's no hope. There's no future. Now, the good news is that Jesus came so that you could get free from all of that. Jesus came so that you could have life and have it more abundantly. He came that you might have a hope and a future in him. And he's able to give you back your soul. He's able to give you back your life if you just let him. Now, what does it take to get that? The Bible says that he stands at the door and knocks. And if anyone hears his voice and opens the door, he'll come in. So that means right now he's there with you. And all you have to do is open the door and say, Jesus, come in. I give you my life. I want to live for you. I want you to take away all these things and I want to follow you all the days of my life. If you pray that and open that door, he'll come in. So, if this is for you, if this is what you want, all you have to do is ask. Now, some of you say, well, I don't know if this is real. How do I know? How will I know he's answered? Well, you can put him to the test, and it's a wonderful prayer. Jesus, if all of this is real, if you really can change me, will you show me? Will you show up for me? And if you pray that with all of your heart, don't do it in a casual way. Don't do it in a joking way. But if you do it with all of your heart, he'll answer and he'll come and show up for you. And that's what he promises. He promises he will manifest himself for you. So let's pray and let's believe God right now. Jesus. That's right. Say his name and say it out loud. Jesus. I come to you and I open the door of my heart and I ask that you would come in. Jesus, I ask that you forgive me of all the things that I've done wrong, I ask that you would restore me and make me new again. And Jesus, if you do this for me, I want to follow you all the days of my life. I want you to be Lord of my life. So hear my prayer. Come into my heart. Make me new again. 
for I ask it in Jesus' name. Father, for those who just prayed, I ask for a baptism in your love. I ask that you break the chains around them and set them free, that even the desire to do anything wrong would be left, it would leave them now, that they would be restored and made new. Do it, Lord. Fill them with your Holy Spirit, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. The Bible says that if you will believe in your heart and then confess with your mouth, you shall be saved. And I want you to take one more step and make a phone call. Number's on the screen, 1-800-759-0700. Just say, I prayed with that guy on TV, and I asked Jesus to come into my heart. When you call, I've got something for you, and it's free too. It's a CD teaching. What do you do now? How do you live the Christian life? What are the principles of the Christian faith? All of it's free, uh, but declare it today. Declare, I prayed. I asked Jesus into my heart, and I want to make him Lord of my life. Well, coming up, we'll be answering questions from our viewers, so don't go away. Well, it's time to bring it on with some of your email questions. And this first one, Gordon, is from Debbie, who says, My question is about speaking in tongues that cannot be interpreted. Is this evil or good? I was watching a Bible teacher, and he said that the speaking could not be inter if the speaking could not be interpreted, then it was from an evil source. Please clear this up for me. Uh, Debbie, it's, it's not from an evil source. Uh, the Bible is very clear about what happens when uh, the tongue is not interpreted means the unbelievers in your midst are going to think you're crazy. Uh, so that's the result of it. Uh, instead of saying it's from an evil source, pray, Lord, give me the interpretation. Uh, and he'll do that. He'll answer that prayer. He wants to give the gift of interpretation, just like he wants to give the gift of tongues. Okay, this is Rachel who says, Scriptures mention women who are barren and the curse that accompanied that. With modern technology, it can be determined whether males are virile or females are barren. Was this a cultural idea that only pertained to women? Rachel, you need to read all the Scripture. There's plenty of Scripture about men who are unable to have children. And if you read in the Torah, they are excluded from the assembly. They are not allowed to even be called a part of the nation of Israel. They are forbidden from ever marrying. So if you think there's a problem for barren women, barren women could marry. Uh, but a, a, a man who could not uh, conceive a child, he wasn't even allowed to marry a woman. So there's, there, it's not a double standard. It's, it's, it's the same standard for both. If, uh, you, it was actually worse for the men. Um, the, you may be caught up that the barren women are perhaps a little more famous. <laughs> uh, Sarah, uh, Hannah, and in those instances, uh, quite clearly their husband could have children because they, they had children with other women. So uh, that may be what you're caught up with. Uh, but it, it just it, God's not having a double standard here. Uh, in fact, it was actually worse for the men. We leave you with these words from Luke 18. The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Let me leave you with this thought. Start thinking, how big is possible? How big is God? And what does he want you to do today?